very grateful for all of you that are here tonight. Good and pleasant to dwell together in unity. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we welcome those of us, those who are joined us on live stream also. Tonight we're, we'll begin the seventh chapter of Amos. This will be our 39th exposition of this book. The prophecy of Amos. This uh, represents his life's work. Quite an investment. Now we're being exposed in this book to uh, something that's mentioned still to quite a few places in Scripture. That God's indignation with sin is a revelation of his righteousness. It's because God is righteous, that's why sin affects him this way. And you will find that the more godly you are, the more holy you are in your thinking and this sort of thing, the more offensive sin will be to you. Whether it's yours or someone else's. It'll particularly be your own. You'll be very, very disappointed with yourself when you come short. Yeah. You'll be disappointed when you see others come short. Now, you want to pick up on that. That's a tenderness that indicates that you're growing in, in grace and truth. It's an indicator to you. So you want to give thanks for it. So in this uh, in this prophecy where God mentions his indignation and wrath so much we're being exposed to the divine nature this is God's nature now some people it's God's nature is also to be compassionate and loving too there's no question about that but some people think that that's pretty much all that God is but there's more to it than that now I remember that in an economy or a spiritual order of things where eternal life is knowing God there's no room for misconceptions of God if that's what eternal life is is knowing him you, you can't have wrong ideas about God you, which one of us haven't had wrong ideas about God but that is something to repent of and get rid of because you can't have eternal life with a knowledge of God that's based on per misperceptions. It, it just doesn't happen that way. There's no room for distortions about God or wrong ideas about him. And how, what his nature is, how he reacts and this sort of thing. If men speak about God, they had better know what they're talking about. Amen. If they say, well, he doesn't, he, he, he's indignant about this or that, they better be right. Yeah, right. Or if they say, he does, that doesn't bother God, God can, they better be right. Because if they aren't, they're worshiping an idol. An right. yeah, idol can be an idea. I want to underscore this because I don't think a lot of church folk know this, and it probably sounds abrasive to them. They think that they have the freedom to think about God however they want. No, they don't. No, they don't. Not if eternal life is knowing God. Now, if without faith it's impossible to please God, as you know, and faith can't be built on something that's wrong. See, if there's a word about God says that it's incorrect, it's not, that's a mild way of saying it, incorrect. That cannot promote faith. You'd be surprised if people think it can. It cannot. Faith has to be built on truth and the, the 
factual word of God. I say all these things because Israel, they invented their own gods after God had revealed himself to them. To them. That's why God's speaking as he does in this epistle. During the reign of King Asa, this happened about 916 B.C., it was said of Israel, now for a long season, Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. That's 2 Chronicles 15.3. We are living in a time like that. For a long time now. I calculate about four generations. The church has been without the true God. It's been without a teaching person. And they've been without the law of God. Now, there was no recorded revival. That was 916 B.C. Remember, you count backward to B.C. That was 916. There was no recorded, excuse me, no recorded revival in Israel until the reign of Hezekiah about 727 B.C. or 189 years after that statement that I just... <laughs> That's pretty near as long as America's been a country. Amos appeared on this scene 37 years before that revival of Hezekiah. And 152 years after that statement about they'd been without, without God, without true God, and without a teaching priest and so forth. This period... <laughs> When they're without the true God and without teaching people, it's, it's assumed that this commenced when, uh, during the reign of King Rehoboam, when he established the golden idol, golden idols, and they changed the worship and everything. It's assumed that that's when that that commenced, when the kingdom was divided. That was approximately 180 years before Amos. Uh, Israel's retrogression <laughs> stretched over centuries of time. I mean, when you look into this, it's, it's staggering. Even to the time of the coming, up to the time of the coming when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was a sad state, even to that at that time, which was over 750 years after Amos. So Israel as a whole rejected Christ and remains in that condition to this very day, 2,000 years after he was enthroned and 2,740 years after Hezekiah's revival. I'm showing you how bad how bad circumstances were. Now, if there's any confusion in anybody's mind about the impact of sin and how hard it is to recover from it, we got Israel. They're a case study. If you think for one moment that a person who once knew Christ and gets immersed in sin, can suddenly recover and have no more problems, you're just dead wrong. Right. I don't think there's any examples of this in Scripture. Someone that did. There's recovery. We're, we're not denying it can recover. But they're going to have a hard, hard time of it. Now, Israel, God sets Israel before us as an example of this. And how they provoked him to a point where he blinded their minds. That means he made it impossible for them to understand. And he closed the eyes of their prophets so the prophets didn't know anything anymore. 
and he closed the eyes of the seers so the people who once saw the things of God he could they this has happened again. Amen. Amen. Except it's worse this time. Because it's happened in a period of greater light. Yeah. Now, many times you have noted yourself the preaching you're exposed to on the media and so forth and the literature and, and how terrible it is. Why is it this way? It's because God's blinded these people in high places. He's blinded. We're living in a period like this. You say, well, why bring something like that up? Because the way he talks to Israel is the way he talked to this generation. In the same, same condition. I say this because I don't... I don't think people think this is serious. I don't see uh, an attitude of sobriety when you talk. people talk about this. They'd rather not talk about this. It has been a bit too negative. We don't want to hear stuff, but someone's got to speak about this. Because things are getting worse. All right, now here's our first three verses of Amos 7. Thus saith the Lord... Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O oh Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob rise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Boy, it's a hard sound, a glad sound at the same time. Now this is the Lord's revealed response to spiritual retrogression. Retrogression when you go backwards. After you've been brought up, raised up to sit with Christ in heavenly places in our situation, in Israel's delivered from Egypt, delivered from all sorts of oppression, given man and given water. After all that happened, is to go back, slide back. And see, the difficulty is in spiritual life, it's all lived uphill. You there's no point in the Christian life where you coast. It's all uphill, all the way, with the wind blowing and the storms falling. It's, it's designed that way. God's not going to give you a lot of strength so you can coast downhill. That doesn't bring any glory to God. When you press through, see that? No, that brings glory to God. So God, this thing of retrogressing, going backward, losing ground. I've seen it happen in people. I've seen them grow cold right under my nose. Lose their edge. Not be as fervent as they once were. I've seen it happen. You probably have. It was shame I admit at one time it happened to me when I was younger happened to me I'm thank God I survived I praise God I, I survived and I'm not going back by any stretch of the imagination and add to this complexity that it's kind of an uphill within you you've got this ad Adamic bent toward the earth <laughs> the law of sin is in my memory you got that to contend with also Now, there is an inordinate amount of activity of professed believers in things that have little or no association with going to the Lord. I would, I, I would hate to estimate how much time people spend on things that you can't 
make them spiritually useful. You can't really do them unto the Lord. They're, they're just things like that. You can't really do it unto the Lord. You can work as unto the Lord, but there's some things you just, they're just for you and that's it. And I'm, I'm chagrined at how much time people spend in that. That's retrogression. These things all take your energies. They capture, take your mental resources. Take your affectionate resources. Take your time resources. And you squander it. And what happens? You begin going backward. Well, I know a person may think they're not, but it's just a, a, just a delusion. This parallels Israel's situation. They were being prepared to receive the Messiah. That's kind of the ultimate objective God had in mind. Get the people ready so they can recognize the Messiah and embrace him. And they wasted their resources. They not only didn't recognize him, they killed him. All right, now this is the kind of people we got on our hands. And Amos says, now the Lord, the Lord showed me something. The Lord showed me. The other version says, the sovereign Lord showed me. Well, the Lord let me see. Well, the Lord showed me a vision. Well, this is what the Lord showed me in a vision. They wrote it down, told us about it, what the Lord gave them to see. Now mark this well, what God shows cannot be known any other way. You got to get it from God or you can't get it. Now I understand the scriptures, they were given by God. That's the only reason you can get it. Because it's given by God. So just fix this in your thinking. What God has to show you, you can't get anywhere else. You can't study it out and find it out that way. Not at all. All the forms of human wisdom, some of which are analysis or logic or deduction, they can't discover what God shows. This is the opposite of what God did to the prophets. They're unfaithful. He closed their eyes. Mm -hmm. He opened the eyes of Amos. And he said, um, he formed, the Lord showed me this, behold, he formed grasshoppers. Now, this is the first of three visions that are recorded in this seventh chapter. Three, three visions. One's the grasshoppers. my bearings here a devouring fire and a plumb line three visions in this seventh chapter he formed grasshoppers <laughs> this is God <laughs> this is God showing him of something see but see it's, this is how God is He'll show you something that'll sound stupid to anybody else. This is the way it is. I know you try to explain the things of God to some people, they think you're a nutcase. What do you? It's like grasshoppers. Can't, can't make sense out of it. So he formed some grasshoppers. These are these are special grasshoppers. He formed them. Some call it a, a locust swarm because grasshopper and locust are kind of the same thing in the scripture. It was a swarm of them, a plague of them. It actually refers, the word actually refers to the larva that would become a locust. So he forms this larva. They're all over the place, but they don't, they don't look like locusts. They're not locusts yet. That's what he said. He formed laid these larvae all over the place. 
Uh, we was in Indiana. We went through one of these locust things where they were laying down at the foot of the trees, and <laughs> it was something. These larvae all over the place. The Lord showed me this. It was a great army of larvae that were going to turn into locusts. And they were going to do what God said he was going to do in Second Chronicles 7.13. He says, I'm going to send locusts to devour the land. These were going to be devouring locusts. It's a type of the Assyrian army. Actually, he wasn't really commenting on locusts, although I, I wouldn't doubt that some locusts maybe came and destroyed the flocks, but I got crops. But he was talking about the Assyrian army who came in like a herd of locusts and devoured them. He called them, and Joel, the Assyrians, he called them, called them locusts, and then he said, the, my great army, <clears throat> which I sent among you. Now, God can do this. God can raise up something that, or someone that will destroy and take everything you got. God can do that. You want to live so he's not it's an inclined, it's an inclined to do something like this. Remember a plague of locusts, real locusts, was sent on Egypt, you remember? That ate up the land. What the what was was it destroyed by the blight and all that? The locusts ate it up. See, God's running the universe. He can call for a herd of locusts. Amen. It's just God. He's at the, He's governing the whole thing. He can turn the impersonal creation against you. And He was doing this because their transgressions had reached a voluminous point. Three transgressions, yea, four. Just they crossed a line um, every day. But I turn on my systems and begin to work. I get a little capsule of the news. And it's a getting worse. Every day it's a getting worse. And I know what's happening in heaven. When it gets worse here, Fires being kindled there. God's becoming indignant there. Here's what God said He is going to do in Jeremiah eighteen eleven. Just capture this language. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame, <coughs> I frame evil against you. How, how would a person survive that? I frame evil against you, and I devise a device against you. Then he says, Return ye now, everyone from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. I think there's some people I could say that to. Now. Come back to the Lord. I'm not telling you to think about it. Yeah. You don't have time to think about it. Do it now. Amen. Return to him now. So I saw me form these locusts. Herd of locusts. A, a, fly, a, a swarm of locusts. And it was in the latter growth, he says. It was in the latter growth. That is the final harvest. And the king's mowings, he got the best of the crop. It's what come up after that. And so this is going to be, what it, when these locusts invade, it's going to be at the peak of everything's really good, hunky-dory, as they say. Everything is going really well. That's when they were going to, that's when they were going to come. That's the manner of divine judgment. Let's the people peek out thinking that evil's paying off. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they think that God doesn't see this. God loves us anyway. God doesn't care what we do. No matter what you do, he can't. He, let, he lets people get in that state. Then his wrath breaks loose. Judgment begins at the house of God. As a society in Noah's day, things just, they're eating, they're drinking, marrying, they're giving in marriages. 
Everything's going fine. Then the flood came. Yes. Right, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're doing the same thing. Marrying, giving in marriage, eating, drinking, buying, selling. Hey, everything just... Then the Holocaust happened and the city was burned up. Cities were burned up. At the peak, you read in Scripture about the fall of Babylon. It's going to look like it's that kind of peaked out. It's going to fall. See, when men sometimes think they're impregnable, we got the most powerful army in the world. We're the most powerful nation in the world. The politicians boast. Some little dinky nation will bring us down over there. Well, <laughs> just mark this down in your book. Men should never brag about their strength. Not at all. No rest there. So this is a divine man. Let's man imagine that they are impregnable. Let's it build up. Then he brings judgment down upon them. All right, he sees uh, God form the grasshoppers. Then it, he, he leaps forward. In the vision, he leaps forward. The larvae have turned into swimmer logos, and they're, they're finishing off everything. They ate everything up. Came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass or the vegetation, they, they, clean, they cleaned them out. Now, I'm going to show you here that God showed Amos this because he knew Amos would have a right response. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. He had to have somebody mm -hmm. that could appeal to his mercy. Amen. And sin makes people hard, uh -huh. and they don't think about God's mercy, and they don't appeal for it. So he divulges this to Amos. When they made an end, in other words, there was, it's going to be the complete destruction of Israel. That's, right. that's, that's, what, that's what he's saying. You can be the, I'm going to just destroy them completely, which is a righteous determination. Now, this, uh, this is not the first time God said something like this. One time he said to Moses, he, the situation was similar. He was provoked. His indignation rose up. And he said to Moses, Exodus 32, 10, let me alone. Don't be praying to me right now, Moses. Yeah. Let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. Now, if that was a mega minister, he'd say, Hey, the Lord wants me now. I'm... That's not how Moses reacted. Right. That determination was the righteous response of God. To Israel dancing around, drunk, fornicating around that calf. God was going to consume them. He had to have somebody. He had to show this to somebody. He had to tell this to somebody who would appeal to his mercy, or else there'd be no hope at all. So he lets, uh, lets Moses in on this. And Moses responds right away. He steps up into the gap. Amen. He knows God. He knows why God's chosen Israel. He steps up into the gap. He says, no, no, don't do it, Lord. Don't do it. Repent of this. Don't do it because the Egyptians will hear about this. And they'll say you brought them out of Egypt to destroy them out here. He's appealing to God's, God's mercy. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the covenant you made with them. He's appealing. Amen. What happens? The Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto them. Why? Because someone appealed to his mercy. See, God's not only got wrath, God has mercy, but he has to have a reason. He has to have a reason to exhibit his mercy. Just the fact that people need mercy, that's not enough. Somebody's got to plead for the mercy. In our day, we got Jesus. He's doing it. But that's the way it was. That's why God told Moses that. That's why God showed that to him. He knew Moses would know what to do. He'll know how to respond. Carnal person just said, well, well, take me, Lord. What's the use? So God showed the vision of consuming locusts to Israel. Of Israel. 
consuming locust to Israel parallels God showing Moses he was going to destroy Israel. And Amos, he steps into the gap. Now the scripture says God's looking for somebody who'll stand in the gap and plead for the land. So Amos steps up into the gap and he cries out, Oh, Lord God, forgive. He knows how God, the years of the Lord, turn from Israel to, you got to see this, brethren. Turn from Israel to, to Amos. He knew that it had been revealed in Moses to Moses that not only will God by no means clear the guilty, in the same verse it says, he's keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So he knows that's the same God. That's the same God. So I can see this over here. He's not going to quit the guilty, but I, oh, I got to remember over here that he's a, he has abundant mercy. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. So I'm going to appeal to that. Oh, Lord God, forgive. When Moses uh, appealed to the Lord about, he didn't appeal to the Lord about possibilities, but he appealed to God's nature. That's what he revealed in Exodus 34, 7. He told Moses, I forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. So he revealed that. I forgive. So, so, so Moses says to forgive then. Yeah. Amen. Amos does too. He says, oh, Lord God, uh-huh. forgive. I beseech thee. Amos says, I beseech thee. That was as I pray or please or he cried out or I beg you. But I like receipts. That's like a reasoning term. Yeah. I was, I'm going I'm to settle here for a while. I'm going to sit down here for a while. I'm going to produce my arguments and produce my cause and bring forth my strong arguments. Amen. I beseech you, forgive. And he adds this. By whom shall Jacob arise? He's small yeah, uh-huh. compared to other nations. He's not going to be able to survive this, Lord. Yeah. Now, who's going to raise up? This is the Messiah's going to come. From. The Messiah's going to come from Jacob. Mm-hmm. How's this going to happen? How's it going to survive? Forgive, Lord. Forgive. They're too small. The people's too small. I mean, there's room to plead this kind of thing today. There's just a handful, Lord. Don't, don't pour out your wrath on and destroy them. But forgive, forgive. See, both Moses and Amos saw that Israel could not survive the uninterrupted outpouring of God's wrath. They, they couldn't survive. But God's promise to Abraham required that they survive. All right, the corrupted high priests, they couldn't plead this. They were alienated from God themselves. The prophets that were prophesying lies, they, could, they couldn't go to God about this. They, but Amos could. Amen. Amen. Amos could. And he did. Yes. I'll picture in Jesus interceding for us in this. Still, like you said, I mean, still Jacob is small. That's right. Uh, I mean, to glorify God, it, it, there's, there needs to be a large amount. So that's why Jesus is still interceding that's because right. God yeah. is going to be glorified to great amounts. That's so. right. It's small. See, God promised it wasn't going to be small all the time. He said it was going to be like the stars of heaven, the sand of the sea. But at this time, that's not how it was. And it's a lot of years had passed, a lot of generations. Still small. Now, this. Uh, this opens more to us something that John wrote about. And I'm, I, I pray and have a strong desire that all of us would be able to take hold of this verse and really get it into our souls. Here's what he said. If, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, 
Now, a sin unto death is a sin that you die as a result of the fact you sinned. Ananias and Sapphira sinned a sin that do no good to pray for them. Judas, he died because he sinned. See? Uzzah, he died because he sinned. There's, sin, there's sins that you die because you did it. So John says later, I'm not talking about that kind of sin here now. And, and only God really can define it. Can define that. All right. What about if you see it? You see a brother now. But we're talking about a brother now. This would be like Amos and seeing an Israelite. He sins a sin. He's still alive. What do you do? Step up into the gap. He's he person that sees the brother sin a sin. He, not the brother that sinned a sin. When it saw him sin a sin. He shall ask, and he, as God, will give him, the sinner, life for them. That's the pleader. That's sin not unto death. He'll give him life for them. You believe that? You believe that God would do that? What is what it says? This is what Moses did. This is what Amos did. This is what Jesus did. Yes, amen. Amen. This is what you can do. Amen. You see a person sin a sin. Now this requires a tender heart and sensitivity and all that. It does. You can't do this and be right. walking in the outskirts of the holy city. Right. <laughs> this won't happen. What do you see? What that? You got examples in Scripture now. People they actually did this. Amen. They, they stepped up and, got, and Israel survived because one person, yeah. one person, Moses in the beginning, Amos here, one person stepped up in the gap of what looked like a hopeless situation. And he's talking now with the Almighty God. And he prayed, and God didn't do what he said he's going to do. Yes. I, I, now, I don't have any physical proof of this, but I know that somebody did this for me. I, yeah. I know they did. The moment that I yeah. saw it clearly, yeah. I knew somebody, some godly person was praying for yeah. me. Later it was confirmed, but but I, I this, is, this is not something that's not theoretical. Oh, no. This is something that's absolutely, when you see it, you didn't see it so you could tell somebody else, so you can tell God. Yeah. Amen. Well, there you have it. Amos, he said, all it, rather simplistic prayer, mm -hmm. Lord, forgive. Two-word prayer. Lord, yeah. or Lord God, forgive. And the Lord repented for this. Amos, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do what I just showed you. I just showed you this vision, but that was for the future. This vision for the future. Yeah, I, I changed my mind. Amen. Say, well, God doesn't repent. I, how do you how do you merge that with He's not a man that He should repent? Well, He doesn't repent out of obligation. He does out of mercy. The Lord repented. Other versions say, for the Lord relented. Or he changed his mind about this. Or he changed his purpose about this. Or he changed his plans about this. Or he decided he not to do this. The expression, the Lord repented, that expression, the Lord repented, is mentioned six times in Scripture. God repented is mentioned once. It repented the Lord, is mentioned twice. Referring to God, he repented himself, that's mentioned once. He repenteth me, is mentioned once. He repented him, is mentioned once. Psalm 106, 45 states, he repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Psalm 135, 14 says, he will repent himself. Jeremiah 18, 8 says, I will repent of the evil I thought to do them. He also said, I'll repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. How's that? 
God twice promised those who turn from their evil way that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them. Joel made a similar promise in Joel 12, 13. The king of Nineveh, upon hearing the judgment of God upon the city, said, Who can tell if God will turn and repent? And he did. When he repented, God, when Nineveh repented, God repented of the evil he said he would do unto them. So there's, there's 21 references. So the Lord said, question, no one should have trouble with this thing. Yeah. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand. One place it says he doesn't repent, and the other place it says he does, well, you got to work it out. Yeah. you got to work it out. Yeah. Don't stand there in consternation. You're, talk, you're dealing with God here. Yeah. There's more to God than being offended. God has tender mercy also, but he has to have somebody who knows him to ask. He just doesn't do it. When you ask for somebody else or for a nation, this can't be like a drunk. <laughs> this can't be that kind of person. In repentance, we're seeing uh, God's character. This is God's character. God makes, he sees sin, causes wrath to rise up. He determines, I'm going to, then someone over here, whoop, appeals to his mercy, and that rises up. <laughs> this is how God is. This is how you are. Yeah. You look at something that make you aggravated, and you'll be a little child, touch your heart, and you just, your whole attitude changes. You're in God's image. This is the way God is. Once God gets mad, it's not once mad, always mad. Nor is it once glad, always glad. Why? Because he's holy. He's righteous. He has certain re responses. And godly men through the ages have seen this about God. So they didn't say, yeah, that's right. They got it coming, Lord. They got it coming. Lay it on them. They knew God. He repented himself. In there where the Lord is righteous in judging sin, but he's also righteous that's right. in meeting a righteous request. That's right. Yeah. That's really what he's calling us into is how to pray righteous prayers. That's right. To fellowship in his righteousness, mm -hmm. that he's righteous in in this in the way you termed it here. That's the right. Scripture terms it repenting. It's a great, wonderful thing to see. He says, uh, it shall not be. Other verses say, well, this isn't going to happen. See, this was a vision of what was purposed. It wasn't going on. This is what was going to happen. So if, if a person is sensitive, they can avoid the wrath of God. They can avoid it if they're sensitive. Yeah. If they're like spiritually stupid and blind and dumb and they go on their way, they can't avoid it. Yeah. God's going to bring the hammer down. Yeah. That's why all in our meetings, in our attitudes toward God, we're trying to sharpen up the heart and the sensitivity of people, get the dullness, get it, get it out. Yeah. Get that, that sleepy soul, get rid of it because you're as there may come a time when your life depends on whether you're sensitive or not you depend on that there's some people were saved because they were sensitive they heard the call now the vision made known to Amos was for the future and it wasn't tied in directly with God's eternal purpose now there were some dreams, like the dreams Pharaoh had, the dreams Nebuchadnezzar had. They were tied in with God's eternal purpose. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine were setting the stage for Israel to be brought in. See, it was a different kind of a... That, that was something that had to do with God's eternal purpose. Daniel, he saw this statue of the great four kingdoms. They were all going to fall. That was tied in with God's purpose, see, his eternal purpose. This was, this was not tied in with that. 
the coming of the Messiah didn't hinge on this, on this here. It hinged on the people being there, but but he could, he could uh, move somebody to, to pray. And stand in the gap, like when he said, "Should I hide? Hmm, should I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? Is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Should I hide that from Abraham? No, nah, that's I think. I know he's faithful. He can, he can, he can handle this. I mean, I know he's going to command his children after. He'll, he'll tell about this too. So he told him. Then Abraham, he, he, he tried. He said, "Are you going to destroy the righteous with the ungodly?" He knew God wouldn't do that. He said, well, how about 50? 50. Now, Sodom is probably a lot bigger than Joplin, but how about if you can find 50 righteous people, Lord? And I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spare it for 50. So I couldn't find 50. He kept working his way down, you know, down to 40, down, down to 30, got down to 10. Is he had be Lot, his wife, his two daughters. I, so they, they would have had to have somebody, even if they had their husbands at 10. That, play it pretty close. He said, I'll spare it for 10, but they couldn't find 10. All right, why can't we pray that way about our situation? In the meantime, seeking to raise up righteous people. See, I don't, uh, everybody has to do whatever they, whatever they think is right. But I think when you're dealing with a, a lot of corruption, I think there ought to be more prayer. God, what you should not gripe about something you can't do anything about. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth now. You should, if you can't do anything about it, be quiet and pray. If you can do something about it, then do something about it. Yeah. Amen. See, in the text we've considered, there appeared to be a conflict with God's purpose to bring the Messiah into the world through Israel. They were. They were corrupt. In order for that purpose, Samus said, they're small, they're small. Jacob's small. Jacob's small. And if, if your fire goes out, it's going to just expunge the nation. Then what are we going to do? Then the promise to Abraham falls to the ground, see? <laughs> the promise to Eve falls to the ground. So he stepped in the gap and appealed to something that was precious to God which is the thought of sending a Redeemer into the world. Now you're right into God's heart there. You're right now. Oh, you're touching where, where his heartbeat is. He said, it shall not be. Now, they were still taken into captivity, right? Assyria still come in, took them into captivity. But they've survived. They say they're the lost ten tribes. Now, they aren't lost. Not to God. Then I think that you could trace their present existence back to Moses and Amos <laughs> in their prayers. Well, I wanted to, uh, that's such a precious text. I wanted to share that with you and say that I would imagine most of us could do a little growing in that area there, seeing possibilities from, from the standpoint of God. And if there's not much to work with, just say, well, not much to work with there, Lord. I mean, if you really, you really give them too many thorns, they're pretty, pretty weak. Maybe it, at least let them eat the pig's food. Huh? <laughs> it, don't, don't, don't send them out where there's a famine. At least they eat the swine's food and keep them alive till they get their mind together, get their heart straightened out. <laughs> See, you can pray like this about, about things. So I'll open if you, any of you have something you'd like to add. You start off by talking about in an economy where 
um, eternal life is knowing God. Yeah. And I was thinking about that. Every misconception that has ever, ever happened, I'm talking about from God's word, has been the conclusions of men. Right. They have misunderstood, and instead of putting their hand over their mouth, they talked about it. Yeah. And they propagated these misunderstandings about God. And, and which on which faith cannot be built. Right. So you've got a bunch of people that say they believe, but they don't they don't even know God. They, they, they've never met him, or they've never met his son, and yet they would tell you, we built many many mighty works in his many name. Many wonderful works. Yeah. But but see this is they've all been built on a misconception. Yeah. Of course Satan's in the background promoting them. Oh yes. But see this is the thing. People and I agree, people need to be very careful when they say God said. The next words need to be very true. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else tonight? Yes, Brother Paul? This matter of God repenting is... Uh, it seems like the, 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 there seems like to be that contradiction because when we consider repentance, we, we consider there has to be an act of forgiveness on the other party. That the Lord does not repent and that we need to forgive Him for... For an unrighteousness that he's about to do. For if he did, if he went ahead with 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 this, with this he he would have been righteous in doing so. Yeah. If he repented, he's he's righteous in doing so. It, it's not a matter of him being unrighteous at any point or in any any of his uh, considerations or what what he does. It, it's. It, I think you're trying. To, I think you see what I'm trying to say here. I'm struggling with the, the well, he, was, he was appeal was to his mercy. Right. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't forgive the people. He spared the people. Right, what I'm saying is that we are not forgiving God. That that God is not required oh, oh, yeah, no, to right. forgive us. In that, I think that's where I think some people feel that there's a contradiction in him repenting. Oh no, yeah. Forgiveness wasn't even the issue in the whole thing. Forgiveness wasn't the issue. With sparing a remnant, that was the issue. See. They paid for their sin. Yes. Uh, I told you said that if you can't do anything about it, don't pray. Pray about it. And how there are many examples in the Bible of men who couldn't do anything about the situation themselves. For example, Job or Joseph. They had no control over it. And so instead of complaining yeah. about it, they prayed and brought it before yeah. the Lord. <coughs> Yes, John. Yes, something that kind of came out to me in the lesson was uh, when you mentioned when God did make known um, impending judgments, like in the case of Abraham in the discussion of the Son of the Lord, it's interesting like who he relayed that information to. Like you have also an example with Moses. For yeah. example, the Israelites in the Golden Calf, he said, I'm going to destroy this nation and make a nation out of you. And that's when Moses made his plea. He said, what, 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 will the, what will the Egyptians say? He brought them out. Yeah. He couldn't keep them. Mm. He, that, the, in both cases, with Abraham and Moses, the issue wasn't like, God, you're not doing the right thing here. That wasn't, their issue was God being glorified. Yeah. Men, men being able to see the Lord's word. That's, that was their concern. It's like, we, this, this would bring more glory to your name if this... Yeah. You see what I mean? Oh, yeah. That was their concern. It wasn't so much like, this is not correct. This isn't right. It's like... But see, their lives were built around the coming Savior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they were built around what God had promised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's marvelous consideration in bringing the, bringing the light this... Uh, way God sets up this situation where he can have someone actually flee. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh. Mercy. Uh, you know, Moses did it. There's actually types of Christ, and That's Christ right. will do this later That's on. Right. And what the thought occurred to me that actually we're entering in with uh, the ministry of Jesus, but we're entering in with Jesus yeah. uh -huh. yeah. in this. Amen. Uh, and we, we sure have a need for this. Yeah, well, uh, go ahead. But I'm through. But, uh, Think of that woman was taking the <coughs> act of adultery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh huh. It was the exact mercy one out. Yes, it's great. Good exhortation, but whatever we rely upon, that it not just be simply comestibles for locusts. 
that we're not aiming, that we aren't look, investing in things that can be taken away from us in that manner. Amen. 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 Yes, Sister Eva. A word on God repenting. Today, repenting is, uh, to a lot of people's understanding, is to say that I'm sorry, that I should not have done that, that I in some way was wrong for doing that. The word repent doesn't mean that you're saying, I'm sorry, yeah. I shouldn't have done it. It means to change direction. Change, yeah, right. It's like if someone's going one way and they repent, they turn around and they go the other way. It's not a matter of right and wrong. You're doing something else. Mm -hmm. That's because he has there's two sides to God. Exactly. See, yeah. there's, there's the wrath side and the mercy side. Yes. So, wrath is raised up for a reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so is mercy. That's right. Amen. So the Lord is righteous in all his doing, so he's also righteous in repenting. That's right. Amen. 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 Well, and Brother Tony brought up the these men being types of Christ. Let's not forget, Jesus did say, Father, forgive them. Yeah. When being nailed to the cross. That's he did right. say that. That's right. Amen. 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 That's right. <laughs> he could have, I suppose, prayed for the race to be expunged. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You, it suffices to say you'll not be able to do something like this mechanically. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. This is something you can only do with your heart. You gotta yeah. kind of have an insight. All right. Well, the word of prayer. Our dear heavenly Father, we thank thee for this example of Amos. And it has opened uh, a lot of possibilities to us. We pray that you would help us to have righteous reactions and to uh, and know how to appeal to your mercy for situations that look like they're out of hand. And we pray, Lord, that you would reserve a remnant no matter what judgment is ahead, that you would not destroy the old people but bring the remnant through the fire like you said you would. In Jesus' name, amen.